praise the Lord for a series called Justice. Let's turn to 1 Kings chapter 18, our theme of scripture, one of our theme of scriptures. First Kings chapter 18, verse 41, Elijah said, there is the sound of an abundance of rain. Amen? And so he said that because verse 1, God said, I will send rain on the earth. So Elijah, he heard this, there's a sound resonating on the inside of him. God said. And what God said was resonating on the inside of him. Rain, 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 rain. And so, let's go. Hosea 10, 12. Hosea 10, 12 is um, our next two theme scriptures. So this is our second one. Because it gives us a little insight into what what, um, what the Lord, how he's been leading us in this series. He said, sow for yourself righteousness, reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground, for it's time to seek the Lord. 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 It's time. It's time. Hallelujah. And as we take the time, as we understand that it's time, and as we make the time, and as we act on the Word of God because of the time we live in, and because it is time, he said, for it is time to seek the Lord until he comes and rains righteousness on you. It's time to seek the Lord until he comes and rains righteousness. Or it's time to seek the Lord. It's time to worship him. It's time to follow him. It's time to crave him. It's time to inquire of him and require him. We need him. That's called humility. Humbling ourselves under his mighty hand. If my people will humble themselves and pray, it's time to seek face. It's time to seek him, to follow him, to inquire, to require, to crave him, to worship him. As we do this, we do this until he comes. See, so, so his coming is a response to our seeking him. It's time to seek the Lord until, till or until, or, or we could say it this way, so that he can come and rain righteousness on us. Well, again, the word righteousness is kind of foreign if we just want to throw the word righteousness out there. But what, what, what's he going to rain on us? What, what kind of rain is righteousness? The word righteousness means justice, right, rightness, prosperity. It means to put, set, or make right. To put, set, or make right. It's time to seek Him until He comes and sets things right. Until justice. He brings justice. Amen? Hallelujah. And what's justice? What's right? It's right. It's rightness. It's prosperity. What's justice? Justice is prosperity. Hallelujah. In every area of our lives. Setting things right. Putting things right. We seek Him until He comes. Hallelujah. Let's say that together. We seek Him until He comes. Hallelujah. Because we're going to see that in James. Let's go to James. James chapter 5. We've been in 
James chapter 5 for a little little while too here. James chapter 5. Oh, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to read James 5 in the Amplified. And then we're going to just pick up and, and continue on. But James chapter, James chapter 5, starting in verse 1. I'm just going to read from the Amplified uh, portion of Scripture. Just to kind of catch us up or get us back into the flow of where we've been. He says, come now, you rich people. Now, he's talking about the wicked rich. Uh, and you'll be able to tell that by the actions that he talks about these these rich people have taken. Because uh, you can be righteous rich, um, and you don't act this way. You don't think this way, and you don't operate this way. But these are the wicked rich. Come now, you wicked rich people, weep and aloud and lament over the miseries, the woes that are surely coming upon you. Your abundance wealth has rotted and is ruined, and your, and your uh, many garments have become moth-eaten. Your gold and your silver are completely rusted through, and their rust will be a testimony against you, and it will devour your flesh as it were fire, and you have heaped up together treasure for the last days. But look, here are the wages that you have withheld by fraud from the laborers who have reaped your fields, crying out for vengeance, justice. And the cries of the harvesters, the reapers, the harvesters, have come to the ears of the Lord of hosts. Here on the earth you have abounded. No, here on earth you have abandoned yourself to soft prodigal living and to the pleasure of self-indulgence and self-gratification. See, the blessing they have just selfishly used for themselves. But the righteous rich do what? They're blessed to enjoy the blessing, but we're also blessed to be a blessing. Amen? They were not interested in being a blessing. The wicked rich don't care about being a blessing. They just want self-indulgence, self-gratification. And he said, you have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned, you have murdered the innocent righteous per people while he offers no resistance to you. So, here's our instructions. So be patient, brethren, as you wait until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits expectantly for the precious harvest of the land. See how he keeps up his patient vigil. In, um, until it receives the early and latter rains. So you also must be patient, establish your hearts, strengthen and confirm them in the final, in the final certainty, for the coming of the Lord is very near. Do not complain, brethren, or family against one another, so that you yourselves may not be judged. Look, the judge is already standing at the very door. As an example of suffering and ill treatment, together with patience, brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as his messengers. You know how, he call, uh, how we call those blessed, happy, who are steadfast, who endured. You have heard of the endurance of Job, and you have seen the Lord's purpose and how he richly blessed him in the end, in as much as the Lord is full of pity and compassion and tenderness and mercy. Hallelujah. So, James chapter 5, we have been in um, talking about, he talks about that our, um, our money has been crying or calling out, streaming. Uh, and the Amplified says, for vengeance, for justice. And he says, our cries, the reapers, the harvesters, have been uh, calling, um, have been uh, shouting, the shout of faith and praise. Hallelujah. And it has entered the ears of the Lord of hosts. And so the, his instruction says, listen, I, I want you, I want you to, to look at the farmer. I want you to take the farmer as an example. Copy the farmer. Verse 7, therefore, be patient, brethren or family, until the coming. Didn't we just read that? We're to seek the Lord until he comes and reigns righteousness until he comes and reigns righteousness. Right here we are told that we are to be patient until he comes. Until he comes. Amen? So see, so for the example of being patient until things come, until the rain comes, he says, look at the farmer. 
The farmer waits for the precious fruit. The farmer waits for his harvest, waiting patiently for it until he receives the rain. The farmer waits patiently until the rain comes. So this is his first instruction for us right here. So I call this three keys to harvest. Three keys to harvest here in James. Three keys to harvest. We could also say it this way, three three keys to justice. Right? Because our harvest is justice. Setting things right, putting things right. Amen? Justice. Harvest is justice. So our three keys, he goes on, verse 8, he says, You also be patient, number one. Establish your hearts, number two. Why? Because the coming of the Lord is at hand. His coming and reigning righteousness, His coming and setting things right. Justice is at hand. Hallelujah. Justice is at hand. Verse 9, Do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. Then verse 10, Take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. And we have heard of the perseverance or the patience of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. So last week I brought this, I brought this to your attention. Verse 7 and 8 talk about per- patience. And verse 10 and 11 talk about patience. And struck, stuck right in the middle of 7 and 8 and 10 and 11 is verse 9. And verse 9 says, do not grumble against one another. Do not grumble. And, and for decades, it's like, I don't understand why that's stuck in the middle there patience on this side and patience on that side and right in the middle, don't grumble. And so there's just some things we don't understand in the Word and we just put it on the shelf and just leave it and under, and just know God knows what He's talking about. It fits somehow. We might not understand how it fits or why it fits, but we just need to understand God knows what He's doing. Amen? And so we don't throw it away, we just He'll bring the answer. He'll let us know. And in this in this series, he began. I be, he began to to give me light. He began to give me understanding, and it began to dawn on me why it's there. Because it's it's three keys. It's not two keys to justice. There's three keys to justice, and he specifically talks about this one key. And says we need to we need to understand this key, lest we be condemned. Why? Because the judge, capital J, the judge, is standing at the door. In other words, if we're going to seek him until he comes and rains righteousness on us, we need to understand. He's at the door. He's so close to setting things right and putting things right in our lives. So close. Justice is so close. But if we grumble, we condemn ourselves. And even though the judge is the jar just judge standing at the door, Jesus said he will avenge us speedily. He's standing at the door. If we grumble, he has to stay outside the door. We have just shut the door. We can say this way. We've just shut the door in his face. He can't come in. He can't come set things right. He has to wait outside. 
So this grumble not became very, very important and valuable. And all these weeks I've been teaching this, I've been waiting for this moment. I've been waiting to teach this. I've been waiting to share this key. But we, we, have to, we, had, to, we had to get here. I couldn't start here. Amen? She said, grumble not. And this is, this is, this is very important. The word grumble not in the Greek means to sigh, to murmur, or grief. Sigh, murmur, and grief. You know, like, oh brother, sigh, oh brother. brother, how long are you going to take? How long is this going to go on? How long do I have to deal with this? How grumble, complain, oh brother. Ay, ay, ay. The definition, dictionary definition means to complain. Now see, that means a whole lot more. Or protest about something in a bad tempered, but typically muted way. Right? To grumble. It's, it's that kind of thing that we will do under our breath to protest about something in a bad-tempered but typically muted way. To grumble, to complain about something, not cheerfully, but in a bad-tempered, not not, not a good-tempered, a bad-tempered way. Synonyms. Okay, so what are, other, what are other words that we could use for grumble not? Or what other words could we use? Uh, is the word complain? Another word is moan or groan. Here's one. Whine. Oh, whiny babies. Whiny babies. You know, you can have 40, 50, 80-year-old whiny babies. They don't just have to be 33. They don't have to be 12. There's adult whiny babies. Why? Because they're mumbling, they're moaning, they're complaining, they're whining. They're whining, whining. Adult whiny babies. Muttering. Now see, this is muttering in a, in a, in a bad-tempered way. This is grumbling. But the Bible talks about that we are to meditate the Word of God. We're to mutter, so it's speaking to ourselves. We speak to ourselves the Word of God, but in this case, we're speaking to ourselves we're muttering, we're complaining, we're whining, we're grumbling about something. Grievance, objection, to protest, to quibble. Quibble. Here's another synonym, criticism. Criticism. Why are they wearing that? Why do, they, why do they cut their hair like that? What kind of shoes are those? Why did they change the lane like that? Why are they in front of me? Why don't they move? What, what's the matter? What, what? Criticism about anything. The people we work with, the people we drive with, the people we live with, the people we were in the mall with, the people. Criticism. Criticism, 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 criticism. It's another word for a grumble. We are to criticize not. Criticize not. Accusation. Accusation is another word for grumble. Accusing people. And belly aching. Belly aching. Just just belly aching about something. You know, it's too hot, it's too cold, it's too early, it's too late, too young, too old. Too fat, too skinny, too tall, too short. Just, it's just too light. It's just too bright. It's too dark. It's too, just belly aching about everything. Complaining. They're just too fast. They're just too slow. They're just... Uh, I'll just complain about everything. Criticize about everything. So since I've been teaching this, I'm having to judge myself day after day after day after day as I work. As I drive, because 
my grumbling, my criticism, my belly aching, my complaining is hindering the just judge who wants to come and set things right. How come it takes a year? How come it takes five years? How come it takes ten years? Well, this scripture can say, we could, God could be saying this way. How come you're grumbling for a year? How come you're grumbling for ten years? How come you're grumbling for twenty years? The issue is not how long, God, are you taking? The issue is how long are we going to wait till we do what he says? Grumble not. Grumble not. So we're not condemned. Our grumbling condemns us. The just judge, the just judge functions justly. Amen? He's not going to promote us just because we're his kids. You know? You might get promoted from grade two to grade three just because, you know, what they decide to. But in the kingdom of God, there is no social promotion. You're too big for the desk. We're going to promote you. No, in the kingdom of God, you just get too big for the desk to where you sit on the floor and you wait until we do and pass the test. Here's the test. Grumble not. Grumble not. So I, so he can come and rain righteousness on us. Grumble not. Complain not. Criticize not. Quit criticizing. Quit complaining. Quit whining. I've told my family this before, but there's this one stupid, stupid song. When I worked, when I worked at a company that they play the music in the store, this song, this guy's singing. Oh, I wish it was back in the good old days when Mama would sing lullabies to me, because I'm, you know what, I'm. I'm not a teenager anymore. I'm kind of growing up, and being an adult is not so fun. It's not so exciting. It, things are just, it's so hard. It's so hard. Life is so hard. I'm thinking someone needs to smack you in the butt so hard that it rattles your brain to where it begins to dawn on you. Life is good. Grow up. Quit whining and complaining. Lullabies. Please. It's just, it's disgusting. And then people ask to get off, get off, not even get off work, get off work, and, and I can't go to school because the wrong person got elected for the government. I mean, this is like this is like a three-year-old. This is like a seven-year-old. Junior high went off. You know, my uh, my fingernail polish got on my finger, and you know, or the guy, my shoelace broke on my on my on my basketball shoes, and so I can't come to school today. Please grow up. Put three knots in your shoes, one halfway up, one. Tie the shoes. Pick the fingernail polish off and grow up. Get, get. Oh, man. Crumble not. And we have whole. We have a whole, a whole society, generally speaking. It's just a bunch of whiny babies. They think it's someone else's responsibility for their goodness. Taking no responsibility for themselves. Yeah, you need to start at 9 o'clock. Oh, no, I don't get out of bed till 10. Well, then go find another job. Oh, no, you're being so mean to me. I'm offended. Well, good. Go, go home and go offended. Go, go home and go offended. Stay there. Don't come back. Don't let the door hit you when you leave. You know what I'm saying? There's these kind of things. Just a bunch of whiny babies. We start at seven. S seven when? Like some, some part of the year, seven's not even light yet. You want the job? We start at seven. Not 7.02. Seven. Seven. Want it or not? Because there's a whole lineup of people here that I'm going to talk to after you. Right? 
if we say yes. We need to be people of our word. People of our word. Honorable. Men and women. Hallelujah. Grumble not. Complain not. This is what we do. You think I like mowing my lawn? I've never liked mowing lawns. But I mow my lawn because it needs to be done. I mow my lawn. I don't care if it's hot out. I don't care if I'm hungry. I don't care if it if it's raining, it doesn't get cut. But the thing about if it keeps raining, it just keeps getting longer. Sun comes out. So it's got to be cut because it makes the place look good. Amen? There's just a... There, <coughs> There's just a whole bunch of stuff that we do because it needs to be done, not because we like it. And yet too many people are grumbling, complaining, they're whining. I don't like to do that. We never, we never asked, that. We, we, we're not been asked if we like to do it. There are things that we like to do, so we get to do those things. But there are a bunch of things we don't like to do. But we do it because it needs to be done. And there's some things that we just change our attitude. I told, I've said this before. I didn't like water. Water, water just doesn't is tasteless. I drank milk all the time. I, I drank milk that was that was real, called homogenized milk. You know, that's where it had all the cream in it. I drank I drank glass after glass after glass after glass of it. I'm actually surprised that my parents kept buying that much milk for me. Because I'm finding out oh, that's a lot of milk. It's a lot of milk. It's a lot of milk. And I drank it, and I drank it, and I drank it, and I drank it, and I drank it. And then when I was in my mid-twenties, I went to visit some friends in the States, took two months vacation, um, and stopped at a number of different friends. I got to Jackson, Mississippi, bought a pair of jeans, because you know what? You can get them at an outlet store. You get them at a much better price up there. And I got uh, uh, two weeks later... Two and a half weeks later, I was up in um, Syracuse, New York, and put the jeans on, and they were too tight. Somehow the jeans, two and a half weeks later, that fit me just fine, got, were too tight. Why? Because I was with friends, and um, their, one of their family members worked at a restaurant, and, and so we'd go pick them up late, and we'd have chocolate brownie ice cream desserts chocolate brownie ice cream desserts put an extra 10 to 15 pounds on me in two and a half weeks. So my jeans were tight. So I figured I need to get rid of some weight. So they said you need to get rid of dairy. That means milk. So my eight week program, I didn't drink any milk. No ice cream. Water, 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 water. After eight weeks of drinking water, that milk was really, really thick. That milk was, uh, it was really, really thick. So I figured I'm going to go down to what's less two percent. I guess it was the next, the next step down, two percent. I thought, oh, man, this tastes good. Because I've had 2% before, and it was it was nasty. It was like watery. 2%? Oh, that's awful. Oh, I might as well drink water. And so so I drank water and, and got rid of got rid of the, the extra poundage, and, and um, but went back to that homogenized milk, and it was like, oh, my, this is too much. So so I went to 2%, 2%. And I'd had skimmed milk before, but that was, oh, God, that was really watery. And to, so 2%, 2% was fine, and... I'm still drinking my water, drinking my water, drinking my water, my 2%. Drinking my water and having some 2%. A few years later, so I moved to Ontario, pastor, pastor in Sarnia, and I'm having my 2%. And um, so I'm going to get getting on a program to building some more muscle and getting rid of some more weight, too, because, you know, you eat a little different again. And so I'm on my program again. Got my got my gym in the house too and working out and and so um, drinking more water and more water and more water and that, the 2% t- 
tastes no different to me than the homogenized, but now it was a little thick again. So, so I went from 2% to 1%. 1%. And, you know, I mean, that's basically water, too. And, and then over the process of time, I even have skim milk. And skim milk, to me, tasted exactly the same as the homogenized decades earlier. But, but it's because why? I was drinking lots of water. So what am I doing? I began to change the way I thought. And when I changed the way I thought and changed my actions in regards to drinking, the way I felt changed. I didn't like water. I liked my homogenized. But as I drank more water, the homogenized didn't taste so good. And then I started going from uh, reverse osmosis water. I mean, there's literally, everything's taken out of it. It's just basically pure water. But there's no minerals in it. Okay, so that's the issue. I mean, uh, there's no minerals in it. So it's really, I mean, it's, it's on the one hand, it's good for you. On the other hand, it's not producing, giving you a lot of minerals that you need in your body, that your body needs. So, so I began buying drops, putting my drops in my water. This is a long story, but it's, there's, a, there's a reason, there's a purpose. All right? What are we talking about? People talk about whining and complaining. We can change. Because here, here's, my, here's my wine. Do I have to drink this? This water is just awful. And then all of a sudden, after a while, the water's fine. And the homogenized milk is like, ooh, that's just too much. We don't need that. And now... I'm water, but now I need to put drops in because I want to put drops in. I, okay, here's the key. I want to put drops in to add the minerals that my body needs. So I'm putting mineral drops in, but they taste they taste nasty. Okay, so you can get your you can get your regular you know regular water, or you can get Evian. Evian is from the Alps, it says, and it still has the minerals in it. It's got kind of a nasty taste to it. Right now, it's normal to me. So, but I'm telling you, before I, before I changed the way I thought, it had a nasty taste to it. It's a mineral taste. It's very, you take a mineral, my mineral drops, it's very salty, and it's, um, but it's more than salt. It's just minerals. It's, it's lots of stuff. So it, it's not so exciting. So I would put my drops in and I would drink it and go, this is how water is supposed to taste. I would tell myself that. This is how water is mm, This is how water is supposed to taste. Mm, this is how water is supposed to taste. Mm, this is how water is supposed to taste. Before the week's over, mm, this is how water is supposed to taste. One day I forgot to put my drops in after maybe a year of this. That water, which I used to really, really, really like, was so sterile. It was like, oh my goodness, blah, 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 blah. this is awful. Because I already told myself, this is how water is supposed to taste. And I forgot to put the drops in. And it did not taste the way it was supposed to taste. I'm telling you, you and I can change what we like and what we don't like if we just make the choice to say, mmm, this is how it's supposed to taste. Mmm, this is how it's supposed to feel. Mmm, this is this. We can change. Instead of whining and complaining, we can change the way we think. Because our body has no opinion. It'll fuss if we let it fuss. And if we take control over it, it'll do what we say. It's not designed to rule and reign. Our spirit, we are designed to rule and reign over our body. Change the way we think. Change our results. So now this is, the, the, mm, this is when I buy water, when we go on a trip, I don't want to drink lots of tap water, and so I'll go buy water. What do I do? I go buy Evian bottles. Why? Because it tastes like it's supposed to taste to me. Amen? We can change. God said, grumble not. 
quit whining and complaining. Why? Because our whining and complaining shuts the door on justice. And we wonder why it takes so long. Instead of looking in the mirror going, you're why it's taking so long. Quit grumbling and complaining. Because I'm good at complaining. I'm good at criticism. Why? Because some people might call me a perfectionist. I'm just organized. You look at my closet. My shirts are all basically the same distance apart, and they're color-coordinated. They're not randomly thrown in there. They are color-coordinated. I like that. So when that doesn't happen, my workspace is organized and clean. When the person acting like a slob next to me, there is a temptation. And I have to catch myself now and go, I don't care. Catch myself grumbling and complaining to myself, right? You, you, you never grumble and complain to them. You grumble and complain to yourself. Quit, want, quit, quit, run. no, I will not complain. I'm not the boss, I'm not the supervisor. That's none of my business. It's none of my business. What does that mean? That means I don't care. I don't take the care on it. If I was a supervisor, if I was manager, that would be under my responsibility, then I would deal with it. But it's not. So it's none of my business. All I do is waste time, waste mental energy. Mumbling, complaining, murmuring, whining about something that I have nothing and no responsibility and no ability to change. It's not my responsibility. How they drive, I don't care. It's not my responsibility. I'm not the police officer. It's my responsibility to be safe. It's my responsibility to be aware of those driving around me. And if they may do something, I get out of the way. I slow down, I speed up, I honk the horn, whatever it might be. But it's my responsibility to make sure I stay safe. It's not my responsibility to make sure everyone else drives perfectly well. Amen? It's my responsibility to be at work on time. If others don't, it's not my problem. If they roll in three minutes before, and they whine and complain because they can't park so close, listen, you want to get a better parking spot? You come in earlier. If all the parking spots are taken by the time you come, just get out of bed earlier. Not just once or twice, every day. But there are a lot of people that just doing something the same every day, it just doesn't flow with them. Right? It doesn't flow with them. So then flow, flow the way you want to flow and be frustrated. I'm not interested in the flow. When my alarm goes off, I get up. I do the things that need to be done, and I leave at the same time every day. I put my pants on the same time every day. I park early. I'm there. I walk in. I get out of my truck the exact same time every day. I walk in the door at the exact same time every day. I punch the punch thing every the same time every day. Oh, that just makes life simple for me. It's not complicated. But not everyone functions that way. You know, we're not, I, we're, we're, not, we're not much for change. We're not much for, hey, you know, we, we decided we're going to do this. It's like, okay, yeah, give me a week's notice. So sometimes we have to be flexible and decide to do something, but we, we, don't, we, don't, we don't like last minute, last minute, hey, you know, I forgot to tell you about this, but we need to do this. And you go, yeah, well, I'm already busy booked. Give me notice. So, but not everyone functions that way. Lots, of, you know, lots of people function like they just they get come up with things last minute. Let's just go do this. Hey, they like that. Okay. 
I need to watch out that I don't criticize and grumble and complain. Because not everyone's like me. But we need to understand this. We're not all the same. So we need to be very merciful with one another and learn to not grumble, complain, criticize, and bellyache. Because we can do that about others. People can sit in church. And the farther back they sit, the more heads they can look at. And they'll criticize haircuts. And they'll criticize how someone's sitting. And, um, they'll, they, can, they can criticize everything. I mean, we can criticize how people park in the parking lot. And criticize, you know, what kind of pictures are on the wall. And criticize the paint on the wall. You know, people will just grumble and complain about everything, anything. Right? Why am I spending time on this? Because this is, we're talking about key number three. And key number three is very important to our getting justice. If, if we think grumble not is, you know, it's just stuck in between seven and eight and ten and eleven. It's just kind of stuck in there. It's really not that important. We're going to wonder why justice takes so long. I'm having to work on myself. I may be anointed to teach this, but I'm not anointed to live this. I have to live this. I have to deal with myself every day. I have to catch myself every day going, no. I don't think about that. Lord, I want to thank, thank you. What's my shout of faith and praise? What's your shout of faith and praise? And when I say shout of faith and praise, it doesn't have to be loud. It can be a quiet shout of faith and praise. Amen. It's a Lord, I want to thank you that you are liberally supplied. Lord, I want to thank you. I'm healed by the stripes of Jesus. Lord, I want to thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for my income. Thank you over and above my job. Thank you. Hallelujah. Thank you. The show of faith and praise. And then there's a temptation to grumble and complain. No, 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 Lord, I want to thank you that you are liberally supplied everything we everything we want, all of our income. Hallelujah. According to your riches and glory by the anointing Jesus, begin to, begin to thank Him. Get back on the shout of faith and praise and get off the grumble and complain. Catch yourself. Catch yourself. Why did they do that? Who knows? And who cares? It, it, really, it really makes no difference. Who cares? Because, Lord, I want to thank you. 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 Amen? The shout of faith and praise, rather than grumbling and complaining. Grumble not. So let's start Numbers chapter 14. Numbers chapter 14. Numbers chapter 14. Grumble not. We will start we'll start verse 26. And the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron saying, How long shall I bear with this evil congregation who complain against me? I have heard the complaints which the children of Israel make against me. Okay, so so let's stop here and let's back the bus up, okay? So that's, um, let's go back to chapter 13, verse 27. Chapter 13, verse 27. So the twelve spies went into the promised land. They gathered the fruit. They gathered everything, and they came back. Then they told him and said, We went to the land where you sent us. It truly flows with milk and honey, and this is the fruit. 
I mean, it's good. The Bible says they had one cluster of grapes that two guys had to carry carry on a pole that they put on their shoulders. I mean, the, the guy didn't even didn't even just throw the cluster of sh- cluster of grapes in his backpack. It, it was so big they had to tie it to a pole, and two guys had to carry this cluster of grapes on a pole on their shoulders. Two guys, a cluster of grapes. We go, we go to the, we go to the grocery store, and you put your cluster of grapes in a bag, and you put a, you might put a couple clusters in a bag. No, the, the, there's no bag that would hold these cluster of grapes. It was on a pole. I said, it's definitely a land that flows with milk and honey. There is abundance. It's good. Chapter verse 28. Nevertheless, uh oh. The people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there, giants. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell uh, by the sea and along the banks of the Jordan. Then Caleb, he had to still or quiet the people. Why? Because when you've got over a million people and they're all excited about this promised land and they're seeing the fruit and then all of a sudden 10 of the 12 spies say, nevertheless, there's giants and there's walled cities and, you know, all the ites are everywhere. And then uh, um, Caleb had to quiet the people. He had to still them. Why? Because they were starting to get restless. He had to quiet the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men who had gone on with him said, We are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. We're too weak. We don't have enough. We don't, there's just not enough. Whatever, whatever, whatever you want to throw in there, they said, We can't. We can't. We can't. And that's what the devil will tell us. When God has, has us want to do something, God instructs us to do something, God accepts us, wants us, the plan of God, we can't, we can't, we can't, we can't. Caleb said, we can, we are well able to overcome it. We're well able to overcome it. But they said, we're not able to. Verse 32, and they gave the children of Israel a bad report or an evil report, the book of Hebrews says, of the land which they had spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants, and all the people whom we saw um, in it are men of great stature. There, there we saw the giants, the descendants of Anak, came from the giants, and we were like grasshoppers in our own sight, and so we were in their sight. Chapter 14, verse 1, So all the congregation lifted up their voices, and they cried, and the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel did what? They complained, they murmured, they grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and the whole congregation said of them, Oh, if it... If we only, if only we had died in the land of Egypt, or only if we had died in this wilderness, why has the Lord brought us to this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and children should become victims? Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? Okay, let's go back. Verse 27. How long... Shall I bear with this evil congregation who complain against me? Right? So we just read their complaint. They whined, they complained, they murmured, they grumbled. How long shall I bear with this evil congregation who complain against me? I have heard the complaints which the children of Israel make against me. We just read them. So say to them, as I live, says the Lord, just as you have spoken in my hearing, so I will do to you. If you want to die in the wilderness, so be it. You're not going into the promised land. The carcasses of you the carcasses of you who have complained against me shall, see, 
the Lord didn't even say he complained against Moses and Aaron. They complained against Moses and Aaron, and God turned to personally and said, You complained against me. You complained against me. You shall fall in this wilderness, all of you who were numbered according to your entire number from 20 years old and above. Anyone 20 years old and older, he said, except for Caleb and Joshua, you shall by no means enter the land which I swore I would make you dwell in. But your little ones whom you said would be victims, I will bring in, and they shall know the land which you have despised. But as for you, your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness, and your sons shall be shepherds in the wilderness forty years, and bear the brunt of your infidelity until your carcasses are consumed in the wilderness, according to the number of the days in which you spied out the land, forty days. For each day you shall bear, um, you shall bear your guilt one year, namely forty years, and you shall know my rejection. They complained against the Lord. And their complaining did not bring justice, right? It didn't bring them into the promised land. What it did is their complaining opened up the door for them to stick and to stay where they were. He said, you spied out the land 40 days for every day. You will be in this wilderness for a year, and you will die here, just on this side of the river of the promised land that I said is yours. I don't want to be stuck on this side of my promised land. I want to get in. I want justice. I want what's right. Amen? We want what is ours what God has for us. Amen? He has a promised land for us. He has what's right for us. He has prosperity for us. He wants to set things right, put things right, make things right in our lives. We want righteousness. Hallelujah. So, the key is grumble not. As we get rid of the grumbling and continue the shout of faith and praise, we position ourselves to be able to step into our promised land. We begin, we position ourselves so God can set things right, put things right, make things right in our lives. Because he wants, he wants to do things right. Amen? The Bible says he works everything together for our good. This is his desire. He's working everything together for our good. And he said it's so good that we will not recognize ourselves this year. Because it's so good. But if we grumble and complain, we have just shut down his ability to do us good. We have just hindered him from being able to make things right, to put things right, to set things right. All because we just want to murmur and whine and grumble and complain, bellyache about something, instead of putting on the shout of faith and praise. It's very important what comes out of our mouth shout of faith and praise ought to replace every time we feel a grumble and complain come on. Amen? Every time a, a criticism comes to mind and thought and wants to come squeak out of our mouth, we have to choose the shout of faith and praise. The shout of faith and praise. Until he comes and reigns righteousness on us. So that he can come and reign righteousness on us. 
so he can come and set things right and put things right. Justice is his will. Justice is his plan. Justice is what we want. So we replace grumbling, complaining, criticism, and belly aching, whining with praise. A shout of faith and praise, thanking him for what he said. Lord, this is what you said. We choose to take him at his word. Now we fight the good fight of faith. See, choosing the shout of faith and praise rather than grumbling and complaining is what we call the fight of faith. Grumbling and complaining is taking us, our attention off of what God said. See, Satan will try to get us to grumble and complain to get us off of what God said. To distract us. To shut down we declare God's working. The angels are working. The Word's working. The Holy Spirit's working. We grumble and complain. What happens? They have to start working. The angels are working, and then all of a sudden, they have to stop. We want the angels to keep working, don't we? <laughs> so, to faith and praise, fighting the good fight of faith keeps them working. Keeps the working. The Word working. The angels working. Father's working. The Holy Ghost is working. The words that we're speaking are working. So let's just keep speaking this because this is what we want. Righteousness. Justice. Prosperity. Amen. Hallelujah. Father, I pray for each and every one of us that you would help us be very aware of of our thinking and our speaking and this temptation to grumble and complain and bellyache and criticize so that we can stop it and choose the shout of faith and praise. Now, whether that shout is a quiet shout or a loud shout, I thank you, Lord. We shout, we declare, we speak, we call, we say what you say. We are thankful and grateful to you. So, Holy Spirit, thank you for helping us. Continually sidestepping, grumbling, and complaining, and criticizing, and bellyaching. And stepping right into the middle of faith and praise for what you have said and what you want to do. Good things in our life. In Jesus' name.